Good evening. What a beautiful crowd. Uh, it's great to see all of you, and uh, it's really wonderful to have you with us this evening for a very special event with Noor Ali Qat, uh, who is going to give a talk on the potential and limits of international law in achieving accountability in Gaza. Uh, Noura will come to the podium after I introduce her, and then uh, after she gives her talk, she will be interviewed. There will be a moderated discussion with Professor uh, Noha Abu Dhab, whom I will also introduce in due course. Uh, Noura Rekat is known uh, to all of us, I think, and that's what brings us all over here this evening. Um, Noura is a human rights attorney and an associate professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Africana Studies and in the program in Crim Criminal Justice. She served as subcommittee legal counsel in the U.S. House of Representatives as legal advocacy coordinator for the Badil Center for Refugee and Residency Rights, and as a New Voices Fellow at the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. She has been an editorial committee member of the Journal for Palestine Studies and is a co-founding editor of Jadalia with her husband, Bassam Haddad, who's also with us here. Uh, Jadalia, as many of you know, is an electronic magazine that's focused on the region uh, and which brilliantly combines local knowledge and scholarly expertise. Nora is widely published, including her most recent book, Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2019. She won the 2019 Palestine Book Award in the Academic Award category for the book. Um, she also won the Independent Publishers Book Awards Bronze Medal in Current Events Foreign Affairs. In addition to her scholarly publications, Nora's multimedia productions include the Black Palestinian Solidarity video and, and website and the Gaza in Context pedagogical project. Her current research seeks to examine the activist praxis in contemporary renewals of black Palestinian solidarity, as well as technologies of surveillance and counter surveillance in Greater East Jerusalem. I'm assuming Abu Dis, which is where Nora's family comes from. Uh, Nora is a frequent commentator on CNN, BBC, NPR, and MSNBC and she has published essays in the Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and the New York Times. She earned her JD and undergraduate degrees from the University of California at Berkeley, and an LLM in National Security from the Georgetown University Law Center. It gives me, really, personally, great pleasure to have you with us here, uh, Nora, and to have you here for the entire week, along with Bassam, and your daughter, Naya. Um, we feel like you're part of the family and uh, your interactions with the community, which included uh, visits in classes today, uh, guest lectures, uh, a workshop with students that will take place, I think, tomorrow, uh, Bassam's faculty seminar earlier in the week and the screening of your book on Arab, uh, Arabs and Terrorism um, 2007 series. Um, it just enriches our soul and enriches our intellect, and um, it really is wonderful to have you here. Now, many of us have admired Nora from afar, and when you come to know her up close, um, it is those same qualities that draw us to her, that make her really very special. Uh, lending a critically important voice to Palestinians and the struggle for liberation. Those qualities, really, the way I would summarize them, she is bold, courageous, smart, and fearless. She is also warm, witty, engaging, and this is important, she is accessible. So I think to uh, producers on television who dare to invite her, uh, one has to give them credit for their courage because to have you on their show is really to be in 
uh, for a treat, and they'd better be prepared for it, as you have shown again and again. Now, following Nura's talk, as I mentioned, there'll be a discussion, including Q&A with the audience, moderated by Nuha Abu Dhab, who is Assistant Professor of International Law here at Georgetown University, Qatar. Uh, Nuha is an award-winning specialist in transitional justice. Her work covers the fields of international law, foreign policy, human rights, and transitional justice. She's the author of Transitional Justice and the Prosecution of Political Leaders in the Arab Region, which was published by Hart Publishing in 2017. Her forthcoming book examines how Arab diasporas have expanded the political, intellectual, and socio-legal spaces of international law and transitional justice. Um, so we look forward to hearing from Nora, and then we look forward to a very rich discussion between Nuha and Nora. You're all here to hear Nora, so please join me in welcoming her to the podium. مساء الخير وشكرا كثير على الضيافة هاي أول مرة من تقريبا خمس أشهر ونص بكون برات أمريكا وما بقدر أقول لكم قديش تريحنا من وقت ما طبينا هون ونحن حول شعب فهمان شو هو العدالة وشو هو الغضب والظلم فشكرا كثير لكم وبكفينا بالعربي I trust me يعني <تصفيق> Uh, let me begin. I'm going to read so that I can uh, stick to notes and leave as much time as possible for the Q&A. Um, and again, a special thank you, especially to Georgetown University, Qatar, uh, to Dr. Safwan al-Masri, and to the faculty and the community that have welcomed us so warmly. Today is day 173 of genocide. We have gone from witnessing children asphyxiated from homes collapsed on top of them for five and a half months to now witnessing images of babies, children, and adults who have starved to death or who could not survive because of severe dehydration. Perhaps, like many of you, I had no idea what a starving baby looked like in their last moments. I had no idea the way that they moved their mouths and lips rapidly as if trying to tell us something in their last seconds of gasping for air and for life. But now I know, as most of us, as many of us know, because we have witnessed this genocide in real time from the victims of it who have pleaded with the world to do what they must to end it. Worse, colonial and nuclear powers are gaslighting us. They tell us that our eyes are not reliable, that the pain that subsumes us and makes us wonder how on earth did our ancestors and our living relatives survive the Nakba. They tell us, they make us doubt that our protests are the source of danger, that our complacency is peace and justice, that anti colonialism is genocide, and that liberation is racist. And yet, no one has relented in our demands for liberation and in our protests because our humanity is at stake. Because the worst possible thing that can happen to any people today, to be ref rendered refugees, stateless, to be placed under siege for nearly two decades, to be subject to systematic warfare and then genocided by air and by land with advanced weapons technologies is happening to Palestinians today. May we stop it and ensure that in fact it never happens to anyone else and that it never happens again. And now, even as babies, 
in tents whose entire families have been annihilated by precision airstrikes, the invasion of Rafah, the last standing city of Gaza, looms large. And pundits are already discussing what happens the day after, as if this atrocity is inevitable, as if our acceptance of it is a given. But that discourse obfuscates the work, the immediate work ahead of us. We must demand accountability. For every life shattered, for every future stolen, not to exact revenge. Not to exact revenge because revenge will not heal us or make us whole or ensure that indeed this never happens again. But so that we build a future that unequivocally rejects this expression of sovereignty, this racist colonial expression of sovereignty that claims the right to kill babies so that they cannot grow to demand their freedom. Whomever should express their sovereignty in such a barbaric and dangerous way. For what it's worth, many of us, especially Palestinians, have been trying to teach these les lessons as scholars and uh, as advocates. Here I share with you one of my first experiences on the ground in Gaza, where only four years out of law school, I joined a legal mission to Gaza in the aftermath of what they describe as Operation Cast Lead between December 2008 and January 2009. I quit my job in Congress to join this delegation, to travel to the region. It is on the ground where I learned laws of war and international humanitarian law, not in a classroom. And it is where I was first introduced to the grotesque talking points that we remain subject to in this moment. Or when, what would have happened had people listened to us in 2009 when we were using this to demand that the U.S. cease its weapons transfer to Israel according to U.S. law, the Leahy law, the Arms uh, Export Control Act, and otherwise? What would have happened had the world listened to us when we repeated that Zionism is a form of racism and that Israel oversees an apartheid regime? Imagine if people had listened to that call rather than to smear us and to say that Israel cannot be racist because it is a form of national liberation for a persecuted people. But here we are, 173 days onwards of genocide, precisely because of a dehumanizing discourse that has made 14,000 children deceased a matter of some common sense or the outcome of tragic war, rather than an alarming siren that has stopped the world, that should have stopped the world in its tracks so that we oppose it unequivocally. It is for this reason I want to address the potential, uh, the potential of and the limits of international law this evening for the sake of accountability. And I know it's a difficult place to start from to even say that it has potential when only two days ago there is finally a Security Council resolution that has demanded ceasefire, and yet we continue to see uh, Palestinians being massacred in their makeshift tents. And I won't, I won't stand here to try to tell you why sh you should believe in the law. I'm, I'm a critical legal scholar. But I will illuminate how it could be a tool for us in this fight. I'll begin by reviewing the ICJ's decision of the outcome of January 26, 2024, and then examine Israel's defense against the charge of genocide, taking it as seriously as I possibly can, 
they have made it very hard. In doing so, I will highlight the historical and legal context that makes genocide clear in this instance, but that also demonstrates how that clarity will be obfuscated before the International Court of Justice, establishing a very strong likelihood that at the merit stage of proceedings on this question, that the court will not find that Israel is committing genocide. So this is a bit of a warning and to also manage our expectations, although Israel continues to surprise us, so this is not written in stone. And I will conclude with thoughts on where we can place more of our hope. So as a note, this analysis in particular regard to genocide as a legal framework in particular, as inscribed in the 1948 convention, right, raises some problematics for us. The primary challenge is that something that legal scholar Rabia Ghbariye wrote about brilliantly and published in The Nation when the Harvard Law Review refused to publish it even after its editors accepted it, when he said namely that the Nakba is not an internationally recognized crime in international law. The Nakba features ethnic cleansing, apartheid, and more recently, genocide. It combines hot and cold violence as it accomplishes territorial consolidation and genocidal expansion. And failure to examine the Nakba on its own terms has created this legal and analytical challenge for us now, which is a problem of legal translation. We have to describe the Palestinian condition through analogy and through drawing on legal frameworks that come from other geographic, social, political contexts. And although genocide and apartheid are universal, they remain closely associated with the case studies that canonized them, namely the Shoah at the hands of the Nazi regime and apartheid rule in South Africa. That is why we are often distracted by comparisons to either case studies as somehow relevant, as somehow telling us that 30,000 killed is not enough to prove genocide, as somehow telling us that because 20% of the Palestinian population that wasn't ethnically cleansed has second-class citizens, citizenship, that it's not apartheid. But we have to examine these as we do as legal scholars, as treaties taken to a high level of abstraction and application. And still, absent the legibility of the Nakba in criminal law, and absent a racial colonial analysis of Zionism, historically enshrined in UN General Assembly Resolution 3379 of 1975 that condemned Zionism as a form of racism and racial discrimination, and later rescinded by the Palestinian Liberation Organization in 1991 as a precondition for entering into the Oslo sovereignty trap, we are making our arguments today in translation as genocide and apartheid. So I'm not going, I think we're, we're far out enough from the ICJ decision of January 26, 2024 that I won't review the application of the Genocide Convention, but just point out a couple of things. There was a tremendous amount of disappointment with the ICJ decision for what it did not do because it did not call for a ceasefire. But there has been too little emphasis on what it did, and it did a lot. First and foremost, it accepted that the court had jurisdiction despite Israel's arguments to the contrary, insisting that this should be regulated by international humanitarian law as opposed to the Genocide Convention. Secondly, it rejected the arguments that everything that was said to incite Israelis to genocide was so far removed from the battleground as to be non-consequential when in fact the court found that there was a direct relationship between these highest uh, members of the military and political establishment and the warfare on the ground. It 
rejected Israel's arguments that there were pre that its precautionary measures of dropping leaflets and telling people where to go and creating safe zones that weren't safe, in fact, belied the intent to kill members of the group, to cause serious bodily harm or mental harm, to deliberately inflict conditions of life calculated to bring about the Palestinian group's physical destruction in whole or in part, and to impose measures intended to prevent births in the group in order to stem a future, in order to destroy a people. In so doing, the court rejected every single one of Israel's arguments, most significantly that this was a legitimate war of self-defense uh, self that may feature war crimes and crimes against humanity. And why does that matter? Why does it matter that there is a distinction between finding that this is plausible genocide as opposed to war crimes and crimes against humanity, which are awful, and in some cases just as awful? Just as awful, but the difference is, is that crimes against humanity are grave and genocide was considered a crime against humanity during the Nuremberg trials two years before it becomes enshrined in the treaty. And it, it, it later, as a result, becomes, it develops and crystallizes into an international crime. Whereas crimes against humanity are committed during wartime and feature systematic attacks on civilians, Genocide can be committed during war or peacetime, and that it targets entire groups based on the racial, national, ethnical, or religious identity. It is the targeting, the specific targeting of the group in the formulation of genocide for the sake of destruction that makes it an illegitimate form of combat and not merely a legitimate war featuring illegal and illegitimate tactics. It is the difference between civilians killed as collateral damage and civilians killed because their destruction is the purpose of the operation. The ICJ declared that Israel was most likely waging a genocidal campaign and found that Israel's measures taken were inadequate and not dispositive of a genocidal intent or the act to commit it, at least at the, plaus at the plausibility level. As and, and then said in its provisional orders that Israel must not commit mass killings of civilians, must not engage in activities intended to prevent births in the group, must not cause serious bodily or mentally harm, must not create the conditions intended to bring about the destruction of the group in whole or in part, and must punish incitement to genocide because one of the most operative articles of the Genocide Convention is its prevention not its punishment. Its purpose is to prevent genocide, not to punish it in retrospect. As put by the South African legal team, the ICJ ordered a ceasefire in everything but name. Israel must impede an un, must Im, uh, implement an unimpeded flow of humanitarian aid, must not bomb safe zones, must not bomb hospitals, should not be laying siege to Al Shifa Hospital, to Al Nasser Hospital right now, must not bomb residential areas, must not commit field executions and further mass displacement. Either Israel must conduct its war entirely differently or not conduct it at all. A ceasefire and everything but name. So why not demand a ceasefire if so, if this is so? Neither the ICJ decision or the five uh, separate opinions really tell us why they declined to demand a ceasefire. There's no logic that's expressed in the documents themselves. So all I can share with you is my guess, my learned guess. I'll spare you that, but tell you one, one important takeaway, at least in my opinion, which is that it's not divergent from existing ICJ jurisprudence. Most people have pointed out that unlike in the Russia versus, um, or the Ukraine versus Russia case where the court did ask for demand a ceasefire, that this represents a double standard, but that was a completely different fact pattern. There, the Ukraine brought the case in order to challenge Russia's declaration of war, where Russia insisted that Ukraine 
was committing genocide against Russian nationals in the Ukraine, thereby giving it a legitimate right to use force. And so when the court found that there was no Ukrainian genocide of Russian nationals, that there was no genocide, that Israel had no purpose to start the war and therefore must impose a ceasefire. The more similar fact pattern is in fact found in the Gambia versus Myanmar. Very similar fact pattern of an operation that takes place in August 2016 that leads to what becomes an ethnic cleansing and genocidal campaign by 2017. And in that case, the court also did not demand a ceasefire in its provisional order. And I don't say this to rehabilitate the court, but I say this that if we are to call out a double standard, this is not where it is, in my estimation. Now, that said, the court could have created a workaround. It could have created a workaround. One of the arguments is that because Hamas is not a state actor, the ICJ couldn't impose a ceasefire on both parties, but the ICJ does order Hamas to release the hostages which means that it's speaking to it as a legal subject, which means it could have spoken to it to demand a ceasefire had it wanted to, right? Giving us a glimpse that a workaround was possible. So here one can say, well, then why not? Perhaps here is where we can take more issue. But even had the court created that workaround, even had the court demanded a unanimous ceasefire, it would not have the authority to enforce it. The ICJ has no enforcement authority. Russia continues its war, despite a demand for ceasefire. That's not Israel or the United States. It certainly is power. But it also indicates to us that the ICJ does not have this authority, and so we should not have expected it to do the work that it cannot do. We are the only ones that can do that work, as we have been doing. So consider how the ICJ has been used. The ICJ provided a tool to agitate for ceasefire, not to find genocide. In individual countries, it enabled those countries to impose weapons sanctions. Think Belgium, think Japan, think the Netherlands, think Colombia. It enabled countries to cut diplomatic ties. Think Bolivia, think Brazil, think the African Union in its entirety. It enabled countries to initiate criminal cases under uni universal jurisdiction in their national courts. Think of the lawsuits in Switzerland against Isaac Herzog, the standing Israeli president, in France, in the Netherlands, and now in Germany to take place next week to begin on April 4th and to continue to isolate the United States and Israel politically, so isolated that the US actually pivoted and now Israel is further isolated. It is no surprise that Israel has tried to spin the ICJ decision as a victory, as well as to deflect from it in order uh, to punish and demonize UNRWA even further. In all cases, this will be far more difficult to prove, so this was all done on the level of plausibility, which is a very low standard. You're not proving it, as criminal case would, beyond a reasonable doubt. Is it plausible that Israel is trying to destroy the Palestinian people? Had the court not found, based on the evidence available to us, that that was not true, it would have been a case against the ICJ and its legitimacy entirely. That almost was impossible. But at the merit stage of proceedings, which will happen anywhere between 6 and 12 years in the case of Bosnia versus Serbia, I think it happened 12 years, 1994 it was brought, and then 2006 it was heard. Right At that stage of proceedings, this standard is much higher and more difficult to overcome. There, there, if there is not a smoking gun from the top level of government that says, destroy the Palestinians, which there isn't. I know it's hard for us to believe, given the racist rhetoric, the TikToks, Channel 2, Channel 12, given the dehumanization, but there isn't. In all of their documents, they have protected against themselves against this accusation, insisting that this is not against the Palestinian civilians, that this is against Hamas, right? So we know that there is likely not a smoking gun 
that indicates this intent. In that case, the intent to destroy can only be inferred from, quote, a pattern of conduct only, and this word is operative in law, only, if the only reasonable inference that can be drawn therefrom is that this was genocidal intent, and this comes from the Bosnia versus Serbia case. And if you're interested to really have your stomach turn and read what the court does and how it operates and probably hate all lawyers even more, you'd read Bosnia versus Serbia where the court draws a hair-thin line between the intent to ethnically cleanse and the intent to destroy. And now what we're seeing, another intent that Israel is displaying to us, an intent to force Hamas to surrender using terrorist tactics. But surrender versus ethnically cleanse versus destroy are examined very distinctly and have different legal consequences in the law. And so, for the rest of my, that, that's really sad, yeah? I've disappointed you of what's to come. Well, that's what I've come to do, okay. Uh, and slightly on a different note, but that's what I've come to do. But le let me now shift. I said I'm gonna do my best to, to share with you the Israeli arguments. Now, the Israeli arguments before the ICJ were quite laughable. Most of them were ad hominem attacks and disparaging, right? But if you take them to a level of abstraction, and I'm doing that for our sake, not for their sake, right? I want to show how, how the court itself, how their arguments still fall flat, but why the court won't be able to refute them. Why the law is not going to be sufficient to overcome their argument. Note that the Israeli argument in general is based on the fact that, this is an, that the outcomes are an unfortunate war, okay? It's just a war and all wars are tragic. Remember Dresden, not taking account any of the irony that Dresden leads to the post-1945 international human rights legal regime, right? Anyway, they don't take us seriously, but I'm gonna do it for them. There are two main arguments in this war of why this is not genocide are number one, Palestinians are not targeted for who they are, they're targeted for what they did. Right? They're not targeted because they're Palestinians. They're targeted because they attacked Hamas and pose a threat. Uh, sorry, they attacked Israel and, and pose a threat to the state and its civilians. Okay? Number two, it's an argument in just war theory that if the purpose of the war is legitimate, then all means of warfare can also be justified. Very similar to the way that the atomic bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima indiscriminate warfare, a disproportionate, excessive use of force, generational harm to Japan and Japanese civilians was never punished, but considered in retrospect as legitimate. And, and even in revisionist history would have saved more lives than had the war continued, okay? So these are Israel's two arguments. Let me start with the first one, that they're not attacking Palestinians, for who they are, they're attacking them for what they did. Let's look at what the, what the numbers tell us. 32,000 Palestinians have been killed, 250 a day, not including those still missing under the rubble. 40% of those fatalities have been children, killing an average of 100 children a day, maiming at least 10 children who have lost one or both limbs to amputation daily, including today. Over 100 journalists have been killed who now understand themselves as targets. 1.9 Palestinians are internally displaced. 250,000 homes have been totally or partially destroyed. All of the 35 hospitals have been attacked. 326 schools, all of the four major universities, leveling them to the ground. 247 mosques, three churches, 199 heritage sites, 1,690 factories, libraries, cultural centers, bakeries, even 16 cemeteries have been bulldozed. Because of the deprivation of food and water, four out of five starving people in the entire world today are in Gaza. And 335,000 children are at risk of irreparable cognitive development, 
disability. Because of dehydration. New words have been created to describe the scope of this destruction. Uh, domicide, epistemicide, scholasticide. As put by Professor Shirin Say Ali, quote, any honest observer of this war understands that the target of Israeli force and its US supplied weapons is the Palestinian civilian. Hamas combatants are collateral damage. Israel does not dispute these numbers, but wants to cast them as Hamas's responsibility for shielding, that even if they were targeted in the course of attacks, they were targeted because Hamas placed themselves in the hospitals, buried its weapons, uh, dug its tunnels under certain homes, thereby making everything a legitimate target. I'll get to why this makes absolutely no sense even in you know, modern laws of war. But I just want to point out one thing that has been taken for, for granted, especially in the media, which is that Israel has insisted that Palestinians who are support Hamas, who are members of Hamas, even if they do not have a role in its political or military leadership, even if they are not combatants, that their adherents to a Hamas ideology makes them legitimate targets. And in the Genocide Convention, genocide does not protect political groups, thereby making them legitimate targets. And yet this is absolutely not true. Civilians do not lose their impunity, their immunity, excuse me, for what they believe. You can have the worst thoughts in this room. If you are not picking up arms, you are a civilian and cannot be targeted. Thankfully, the ICJ recognized Palestinians as a national group and rejected this argument in part. But now, let me go back into something that the court is not going to take into consideration, which is what Palestine Studies offers us, which is the historical offering that Palestinians have been constructed as a threat, not because of what they do, but precisely because of who they are. They have been presumed guilty by virtue of their refusal to disappear or surrender their claims to sovereignty. Palestinians are racialized as dangerous, not because of how they may individually harm Israel, but because their national existence challenges Zionist settler sovereignty. Consider, for example, how the right of return of Palestinian refugees is framed as an existential threat, calling for the right of return is equated to calling for the destruction of Israel in this construction. The use of violence and the logic of collective punishment against Palestinians has underpinned Israel's military uh, strategy in the founding years of the Israeli state, even in cases where they posed no military threat. This is Plan Dalit, introduced in March 1947, that sanctioned the targeting of Palestinian villages accused of providing assistance to Palestinian militants, or that might serve as strategic basis for attacks in the name of achieving a defensive system. So even since 1947, the attack of Palestinians, not because of what they did, and precisely because of who they are, has been framed as defensive force. Later, Israel adopted Britain's military emergency regulations that were established during the Great Palestinian Great Revolt of 36 to 39, when Israel was established, its first act of government was to adopt these military regulations almost in whole and to apply them exclusively to the Palestinians that remained. A year afterwards, a military commission determined that they posed no threat to Israel. And yet, founding Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion insisted that emergency regime remain in place, that martial law that you all might be more familiar with as it's applied to the West Bank and previously in Gaza, remain in place for the sake, I quote, of establishing Jewish settlement in all parts of the state. And so that military regime remained in place for 18 years before it was applied to the West Bank in Gaza in 67. Securitization of Palestinians becomes ensconed in police and military discourse in the early 2000s. 
Since the Second Intifada in the early 2000s, Israel began to develop legal technologies that would allow it to use greater military force against the population that it occupied. A cornerstone of this technology in legal language is to shrink who counts as a civilian. What I describe as the shrinking civilian. That doesn't mean that Palestinians shrink in size, but it shrinks who can be counted as a Palestinian. And we see that even today becoming much worse, that Israel, for example, is calculating that, uh, that its military advantage shouldn't be measured in any single attack, but across the entire operation, for example. In other example, it de redefines who can be considered a direct participant in hostilities and irregular combat. I'm sorry if this is too legalese, but let me just give you this example, that civilians who pick up arms can be targeted during the time that they pick up those arms. Well, Israel in 2006 in a Supreme Court decision changed, removed the temporal scope, so it doesn't matter if they put down their arms. They that becomes rest for them, and it's a continuous combat function, which enables the targeting of those Palestinians who chose to fight even when they're not fighting, thus making them, their families, their neighborhoods, targetable and collateral damage, shrinking civilian. There's a lot on that, but let, let me skip ahead, and you can ask me about that in the Q&A. And move to the second argument. If the attack is legitimate, then all forms of all means of warfare are legitimate. Now here, this entire argument is based on Israel's claim that Hamas's operation on October 7th was uh, basically raised the right, right, triggered Article 51 of the, U uh, of the UN Charter, which is the exception to the prohibition on the use of force enshrined in Article 2 of the Charter. Right? And even and, and Israel is drawing on the precedent that the United States set when Al Qaeda attacks Al Qaeda attacks the United States in two thousand and one, where up until two thousand and one, non state actors could not be considered as actually launching an armed attack. They had to be met with uh, law enforcement, not with military force. But UN Security Council's resolutions 1368, 1373 may gave the US the right to respond to Al-Qaeda by responding to, to attack Afghanistan, which anyways, I'll pause there and get to the point here. Israel is trying to use this argument to use the right of self-defense in responding to the Hamas operation, but they cannot, they cannot. In 2004, the International Court of Justice already responded to this argument. Israel made it in its, uh, in its justification, its legal justification for the route of the apartheid wall or the annexation wall, 85% of which runs through the West Bank. When the court said very clearly that unlike in 2001, when Al-Qaeda attacked the United States, right, that in this case, in this case, the armed attack originates from within the territory that Israel has effective control over. Therefore, the failure to prevent this attack is Israel's failure. That's a legal argument, but the sum of it is that Israel does not have the right to self-defense against territory that it occupies, period, period. Um, but. It, the attack has to be attributable to a sovereign state. Now, Israel wants to argue that Gaza is not sovereign, but it could be attributable to so as a sovereign because it withdrew its forces and its settlers in 2005. But here, I want to bring up other exceptions that Israel is making. Israel usurped Palestinian sovereignty in the West Bank and Gaza and has a duty and a responsibility to protect those civilians under its occupations until the reversion of that sovereignty. That means that any insecurity and disorder in the territories is attributable to Israel itself rather than a foreign state. And the proper level of force should be regulated by occupation law rather than the laws of war. But because Israel desires Palestinian lands without the Palestinians on them, it has insisted since 1967 that there is no sovereign in the West Bank and Gaza. 
This is the missing reversioner argument. The argument goes that because Egypt never laid claim to Gaza and because only the UK and Pakistan recognize Jordan's claim of sovereignty over the West Bank, that there is no sovereign in these territories because they never recognized Palestinians as a people. Therefore, the territory is disputed and not occupied. What's the outcome of that? If it's disputed, you don't have to apply occupation law, including its prohibition on the settlement of civilians in the territory that you occupy as a matter of law. You can just cherry pick and apply occupation law as a matter of fact. Israel is claiming that the Gaza and the West Bank are sui generis, Latin for unlike anything else, where it's an exceptional legal framework. There's no analogy. There's no precedent. So this is how legal thinking works. You get a fact pattern. You see what that fact pattern looks like. And something is the closest to it as a matter of analogy or something that happened before it as a matter of precedent. When Israel claims that the West Bank and Gaza are sui generis, it's saying that there is no existing law that it applies, thereby giving itself the authority to create new law, which is what it has been doing. And under this exceptional framework, Israel in 2000, uh, 2001, during the Second Intifada, described the Palestinian Intifada as neither a civilian uprising that should be met with police force, nor is it an international armed conflict of a nascent sovereign struggling for its liberation, right? Because the former, it would have to acknowledge that it governs over a population that doesn't have any voting rights. Awkward. Or it would have to recognize that Palestinians are actually a sovereign with the right to self-determination. Very awkward. And instead, its military lawyers created new law, insisting that its challenge was sui generis and called it, and I quote, an armed conflict short of war. They made it up, which enabled Israeli military to use military force, lethal force, against a population where the population could not fight back legitimately. Whether they target soldiers and military installations or they target civilians, all of it becomes illegitimate, criminal, and terroristic. Uh, and in, upon its disengagement of Gaza in 2005, Israel then declared Gaza was sui generis. It was neither independent because the occupation ended, nor was it occupied because it maintained effective control, but it was a hostile entity. The International Criminal Court rejected that argument in 2014 in its dicta, declaring that Gaza remains occupied territory. So if we then reject Israel's first argument that this is a legitimate war based on self-defense, then what else can we make of its operation? Let's examine what its operation is attempting to do. We are told, we are told, that Israel has three military goals in Gaza, which is to decimate Hamas, to retrieve the captives, and to turn the Palestinian population against Hamas, right? Five and a half months of no red lines, and Israel is nowhere closer to achieving any of these military goals. Hamas is launching operations from the middle of Gaza City, has the arsenal to continue, the hostages and the captives that have been retrieved have been retrieved through diplomacy, not the military operations. And from what we understand, Israel doesn't really care about the hostages as they've shot them with white flags raised, as they've allowed them to starve to death. And certainly, this idea of turning Palestinians against Hamas is not true. Not only has Hamas become more popular amongst Palestinians, they've become much more popular in the Arab world and, in fact, across the globe according to U.S. intelligence. So what then? If, if not, if, though, if that is not what Israel, either Israel is trying to achieve these goals and its army sucks. I'm sorry, I was looking for the word. Its army is inept, right? And frankly, maybe. Maybe they should just stay on TikTok, right? <laughs> Or that's not the goal of the operation at all. That's not the goal of the operation at all. And, and for many of us, it has raised the presumption that that's not the goal of the operation, that Israel has an other, less explicit military goal framed explicitly as the removal 
of all Palestinians in Gaza to achieve sustainable security, or less explicitly as the tacit suggestion that the decimation of Hamas is so worthwhile that 2.3 million Palestinians are a justifiable register of harm. In both iterations, it is the establishment of what I describe as Nekba peace. Nekba peace. I know that seems odd. Nekba, catastrophe, peace. But think this is Zionist math, so it doesn't add up. Hmm? Um, but it has a historical precedent in Palestine. And in fact, the former Shin Bet director and national security member Avi Dichter explained in November, who, by the way, we sued in the United States in the Southern District of New York in 2005. So he remains here as well because of a lack of accountability. But Avi Dichter said in November 2023, quote, we are now rolling out a Gaza Nakba, Gaza Nakba 2023. That's how it will end. And in fact, that's precisely what we're seeing. Now it's a battle, and what they're considering, right, is the equation. Is it the retrieval of the captives? Is it the retrieval of the captives and a return to a very destructive status quo ante that was never normal life for Palestinians? Or is it the sacrifice of their captives in order to reoccupy the north of Gaza? This is literally what is on the table before us in very explicit term. This logic says that the proximity of Gaza inhabited by 2.3 million Palestinians, two thirds of whom are refugees seeking return to their original homes, makes the entirety of Gaza and its population, civilian and otherwise, a threat that needs to be removed or permanently subdued. Accordingly, Israel has insisted that to achieve its military purpose of sustainable self-defense, it should not be subject to red lines, which it has not been subject to red lines. And in turn, it has a sovereign right. A sovereign, right? Because in international law, there's this conundrum. We think it's about us. We think it's about you and me and individuals. But international law primarily protects states. And so our existence is constantly being challenged, which is why, for example, the U.S. imprisons one out of every three black adult men, right? It's why we see countries like Myanmar commit genocide against their uh, Rohingya population. It's why we see China place its Uyghur population in camps to re-educate them. How is it? that this can take place. Many of you say because laws are fiction, but in fact the law is protecting the state because the states have this right. And Israel is claiming that it is its sovereign right as every other colonial and settler colonial power has before it to commit genocide in order to achieve its security. I'll spare you with the historical precedent where this comes up in the early 2000s and competes with the withdrawal plan. This was presented by Giora Iland and competed with Ariel Sharon's plan for withdrawal, obviously the latter. Um, the latter prevailed. But what, I, what I, I will say is that we are witnessing a Nekba. We are witnessing a Nekba that features removal, exclusion, colonial settlement framed as necessary for Israel's durable security, as exclusive as Zionist sovereignty. And the recent ICJ decision concluding that Israel is plausibly advancing a genocide is part of the effort to reject this exception. It's another exception of sui generis, unlike anything before, right? However, given the invisibility of the Nakba and international criminal law, the law will probably not save anybody. Moreover, the Nakba was committed in the shadows of the drafting of the Genocide Convention. This is, we're talking about between 1946 and 48, right? And the Nakba was committed between 47 and 49. Palestinians whose self-determination was forcefully thwarted, a key feature of the Nakba, could not accede to the newly drafted con Genocide Convention. And Israel, viewed as genocide's canonical victims, could not be conceived as its first accused. The international community has continued since then to normalize this Nakba, to actually make it precedent through the recognition of Israel, through Resolution 181, through Resolution 242, through even more recently the ICJ case that's contemplating the legal status of the occupied territories. As forceful as that was, the key logic of that argument 
is that there should be two states. There was no challenge of the Nakba. That that happened and it could be accepted and it's an exception to all the violations as long as you recognize a Palestinian state in the West Bank in Gaza. So this exception has been normalized in the law and even by allied states as well as the formal Palestinian leadership. And today Israel is continuing its tradition of exception, the exception that the territories are not occupied but disputed. It's exception that its warfare against Palestinians is not an international armed conflict or a, a civil uprising, but an armed conflict short of war. An exception that the Gaza Strip is a hostile entity. And now an exception that what it's doing in the Gaza Strip is not genocide, but in fact self-defense. So how do we reject that exception? How do we reject that exception? I, do, I would not place my hope at the ICJ. And as much as I said I thought I liked what the ICJ did, I, I exalted it to some extent, and I supported it amongst the legal teams that wanted to bring it. But I didn't do it in order to find genocide. I supported it beca because it became, becomes a tool for us in order to agitate for ceasefire. So oftentimes we use the law in counterintuitive ways, and I look forward to getting into that with Professor Abu Dhab, uh, more on that. And I also skipped over the laws of war and why Israel's uh, war is actually outside of the bounds of accepted um, warfare that regulates guerrilla combat since 1977. But let me close on this note. Oh, I was just showing that the world knows what's happening. Let me close on this note. We can argue as much as we'd like about what Israel is doing and the precise meaning. And I, I, you must be frustrated even in this moment. You know, who cares what it's called? It's wrong, right? Well, the law cares. And the law will split hairs, which is why that's, the law will follow what you do in the, in, on the streets, in these auditoriums, in your classrooms, in your places of worship, in places where you have access to diplomatic fora, that's where it matters. Um, but what we're witnessing is precisely that. We are witnessing an unprecedented mass mobilization across the globe. Millions and millions of people who I think, I'm convinced, they were the reason even that the Republic of South Africa felt empowered to bring its case, not the other way around. We, we know this from also polling. Youth and racialized minorities in the United States, which is really significant, not just because that's where I'm coming from, sorry, but it's really significant because this is a US war. It's not US complicity, this is a US war on Palestinians. And so what we're doing matters in order to stem that war. Youth and racialized minorities in the US who for the past 20 years have led movements for racial and gender justice, who have led movements for gun reform, who have led movements against climate catastrophe have been primed to distrust government and to distrust the adults, all of us, who have failed them. They see Israel together with white supremacy and capitalism as a threat to their future. In recent polling, 67% of respondents under 35 and 64% of respondents of color opposed Israel's actions in Gaza. High school students, high school students who have not even received a, a college education and have not studied Palestine as much as those with PhDs who still can't decide, who still tell you this is complicated, understand that there is nothing complicated about the murder of babies and about starving them to death. And high school students have staged walkouts, rising calls around the world for a free Palestine, voice more than the commitment to ethical solidarity with Palestinians. Free Palestine has become a rallying cry for collect collective liberation around the world. This dramatic shift is likely a generational one, and it may not bring improvement immediately, the improvement that we need to see in a meaningful change, especially for the Palestinians in Gaza, but it does signal hope for in the future of our humanity. 
The question of Palestine will likely be at the center of that commitment to a future, and it's being reshaped forever by this rebellious new generation, and that is a very good thing. So with that, free Palestine, free us all. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Noura, thank you for such a powerful presentation, very lucid, very informative, very important. Um, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm going to give what? you What? I thought it was so clear. Give you a minute. <laughs> give you a minute to. No, no, go ahead. To have your water. Um, maybe I should put this over here. OK. My first question, and I have a very quick follow up question to it. You say we need accountability. Can you explain what that accountability exactly looks like or should look like? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? That's an excellent question. What does it mean when we hold someone to account, right? Well, first of all, it means, first and foremost, it means centering a victim and a survivor and hearing their story to explain to us what they've experienced. It means the opposite of gaslighting, but it means being able to honor these stories. It means actually taking collective action on behalf of those survivors so that we don't leave it to vigilante justice in order to achieve the necessary components that will make them whole. Now, that can look like different things in different cases, but I think at the very, very least in this case, it means an acknowledgment without controversy that what we've seen for the past five and a half months is genocide, is illegitimate, that Palestinians in this case deserve reparations, deserve to be made whole again, frankly deserve freedom, although I don't think that that's gonna be the direct, that's, the con that's what we have to continue to do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And for many, many people that means punishment of Israel, I might diverge on that, punishment of Israel and Israelis, I think it's far more important for us to be acknowledged, right? Um, and to be recognized and to have the world act on our behalf rather than continuing to act on our own behalf mm -hmm. with a, a, a few allies here and there. I think, so think about the way, think about, you know, international tribunals. Those have been sites of accountability, mm -hmm. right? And that resulted, for example, in, in just recognizing the stories that weren't heard before, the confrontation with those who caused you harm. In this case, I would imagine that it, it results in a complete shift in policy, arms embargo on states that you know, commit genocide. It means cutting of diplomatic sanctions. It might be the exclusion of a state or its removal from the United Nations. You know, its return upon certain, these things can be negotiated, but the whole idea and the way that I see it is that it's, it's a, where centering the survivor is followed by a collectivity that takes on responsibility for them so that it becomes universalized and not just individualized. Because you say, you, you also say that now is not the time to talk about the day after or that it sort of obfuscates, but can you, can you really separate the two? I mean, isn't, isn't this accountability that you were just talking about integral to what happens after? Well, here's why I say that. Because most people who talk about the day after put us in this loop that they've put Palestinians in for now seven decades, mm -hmm. right? What's your plan? What's the blueprint? When they're really asking us, if we allow you to be free, can you promise that Israelis will be safe? That's literally what they're asking us when they say the day after. So give us the political arrangement that would work, that would center Israeli prerogatives, right? And even now, right, the discussion is around one state, two state, a collectivity, what happens. And I just feel that that's so offensive when we can't even tell Palestinians there is a world that exists where you are safe from harm. And so accountability is that, is the guarantee that the right to life is not at threat. 
And they're the only ones whose right to life is actually under threat. Whose actual right to life, mm -hmm. whose children who can survive is under threat. Mm -hmm. And so when, I, when we're talking about the day after, it's making that distinction that before we get into the politics, how will we, you know, and what is politics? Politics is the negotiation over scarce resources, right? Before we get into that discussion, and here the scarcity is land and sovereignty over it, that there has to be a discussion about fundamental rights in our natural world that stem from religion, be it the Quran or the Torah or the Bible, whatever, what have you, mm -hmm. that guarantee a right to life and dignity. And, and here is where I feel like we can't, we can't skip that stage. Mm. And I think that too fast, I think that too fast people, the world leaders in particular, want to sweep this under the rug and not deal with it. And not look, at, let Palestinians look them in the eye to hold, them, to hold us responsible. We're responsible. And I think that has to happen. And then we can talk about, now what do we do, mm -hmm. right? But I, I, there, there's a desire to just move past this mm. almost completely. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, think that that's, I think that that's really offensive. OK. OK. And you outlined very clearly how Israel um, creates new laws, right? You gave a, a few examples. The shrinking of the civilian, which I know you've written extensively about. Um, this whole idea of an armed conflict short of war, et cetera. But don't you think, I mean, so Israel can create all the new laws that it wants. Then you have certain cases such as the 2004 wall opinion, which has proven to be quite you know, crucial in simply in debunking the right to self-defense argument. So should we really be worrying so much about Israel creating new laws? Is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> I'm trying to, basically I'm asking you, do you think that, uh, given the limits of the ICJ and international law in general, these cases, such especially the 2004 wall opinion, yeah. and its significance to the right to yeah. self-defense argument, yeah. what, what is, could you expand on that? Uh, sure, you? two things. Number one, absolutely we have to be worried about the exceptions that Israel is trying to create in the law. Because once they create the exception for Palestinians, they become exceptions everywhere else in the world. What's to stop Myanmar from saying, Israel did it, we do it, right? Think about the way that Israel created an exception for extrajudicial assassinations, prohibited in order to kill somebody, you need to have some sort of hearing, right? Guilty, not guilty, some sort of fair trial, which you, know, you can say all you want about that, but the idea is that Outside of the law, you can't assassinate people. Well, Israel started assassinating people in 2001. And, one, and initially, it was opposed. Mm -hmm. Even though the Bush administration picked up the policy of extrajudicial assassinations and its so-called war on terror, right? Um, and initially, it was opposed. But once the Obama administration picked up that policy and committed more extrajudicial assassination in its first year of office than all of the Bush administration's four years, now suddenly with a democratic leadership and a liberal in office, th that we saw the steady normalization of extrajudicial assassinations now become targeted killings that have not only been accepted, but have been exalted as the better, more humane approach to war. Right? And the idea of the unlawful combatant. The unlawful combatant. I mean, these exceptions are dangerous mm. for the entire world, mm -hmm. right? So I do think that the exceptions that Israel creates matters very much. Okay. But then you ask me about the 2004 decision, which is like, okay, fine, you get a legal ruling that said you can't do it, right? So what's the purpose of the law? Let me place responsibility where it needs to be placed. The court did what it needed to do, which is basically tell us its interpretation of the law. That's all the court does. It doesn't have enforcement authority, right? The responsibility is on us. And in 2004, had the Palestinian leadership ran with that decision in a diplomatic marathon across the globe to impose sanctions, to use it to say, 
that Israel is building this wall illegally. You cannot engage with the state. You cannot engage in trade. You cannot uh, even, you know, just even limit it to the settlements, to mm -hmm. settlement products. Mm -hmm. Then we might, you cannot sell concrete. And I won't name names of who sells concrete to Israel to build its wall. You can name them. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, Palestinian leaders sold that concrete. So when we think about the inefficacy of the 2004 ICG decision, that inefficacy is not in the law, that inefficacy is in our leadership that failed to use that decision as it should have properly been used. And they don't just stop in 2004. In 2009, the, um, Richard Goldstone, the South African jurist who basically studied the same, went and did the same legal research we did in, in, as the National Lawyers Guild, came back and found, listen, this wasn't just collateral damage. This is the Goldstone Report, right? A commission of inquiry that's established by the Human Rights Council that finds Israel targeted civilians. We, the Palestinian leadership, dropped it because they were promised a better negotiating position. So there's this idea that the law is not doing its work, but the law doesn't do anything. The law is a tool. And the Palestinian leadership has forfeited this tool in order to, be, to pursue a politics of acquiescence rather than a politics of resistance has sought to be within the US and Israeli sphere of influence rather than to be opposed to it. And so instead of using this tool, has instead used it as a threat. Give us a state or we will punish you or we will pursue this. Mm -hmm. And so again, I, that's, why, that's why. This is why we have these tools that we haven't used adequately. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult for civil society to do it. Again, this is, this, is a, this is about diplomacy and state interactions. So I, in my capacity as a legal advocate that represented a Palestinian human rights organization at the United Nations, took the Goldstone Report to UN Security Council member representatives in New York and said it was your obligation to apply these findings that included an arms embargo on Israel. And their response was simple. The Palestinian Authority has told us not to. Wow. So this is the, 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 the space that we're in, and, and I, I kind of sound like I'm defending the law. I'm not. I, I'm, you know, I just want us to understand that we want, we want to be angry because nothing is working. But we have to know where our anger should be directed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And targeting the, well, of course, but. <laughs> Targeting the law is shooting down one of the tools that we have available to us. So why would I want to do that? As opposed to pointing it at, at the leadership that needs to be, frankly... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you two more questions and then I will turn it to the audience for Q&A. Can, can we go to 8.45? Is that okay? Because we did start later. So. <laughs> okay. عمره ما حدا قال لي انه انا بحكي كثير على فكره ولا مره ابدا well okay so you so i have a question about okay i want to sort of zoom out a little bit about international law um, we know that the palestinians and this is the case for many other oppressed people around the world have been ex suffering mass atrocities over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. And they are punctuated with uh, episodes of spectacular violence and crises, right? Um, we kn also know that when there is such a crisis, um, for example, when Russia invaded Ukraine, international law is in the spotlight, right? Everyone's talking about international law. We're talking about establishing a special tribunal on the crime of mm -hmm, aggression. Mm -hmm. We're going to the ICC, we're going to the ICJ. Do you think that international law, and this might be a rhetorical question, um, <laughs> said the international lawyer, oh. fails in a particularly bad way when atrocities are when it when it in, in its in its uh, in the way that it addresses or not 
these slow atrocities over an extended period of time as opposed to during times of crisis? And do you think that international law could and should play a better role in addressing these atro mass atrocities that hope happen over an extended period of time? No and yes. Okay. Okay. Um, Here's, here's, that's the, really the short answer, but this is what I want to also remind folks. International law is not, uh, is not a thing, right? You don't go to an office and talk to international law. It's not an agent of change. International law is a material that we use. And in the way that I think about international law, it means nothing, really. No matter what it says. No matter what it says, it means nothing. Its meaning will be determined in an adversarial process, right? Either, you know, for, for a position for, a position against, using, you know, evidence, facts, argumentation, logic that get, then gets interpreted by a, uh, a judicial panel, mm -hmm. one judge up to nine judges, however many, 16 judges in mm -hmm. some cases, mm -hmm. who then apply their own interpretation of it based on their biases, their fact, the political outcomes that they want to then tell us what international law is. So all international law is, at the end of the day, is a battleground, period. It's a battleground. It's not a destination, it's not a, it's not a set of values, it's not, when people say we're all, we all have to live under international law, I'm like, really? Right? It's a battleground for us to adjudicate our own preferences for a particular outcome. And so, so much of it is contingent on the balance of economic, military, and social power. So much of it is contingent on uh, historical circumstances. Have we just recovered from fascism and atrocity, or are we on the brink of fascism and atrocity? So much of it revolves around the characters in leadership, the individuals who are bringing the material forward. And so this idea when we start to you know, take this to a level of, of great abstraction, I think loses the nuance of, of what we have before us. So in this particular moment, right, I actually think we need to be using international law. Not necessarily to prove genocide, right? But in order to agitate for a ceasefire, to give us a tool. I think that we need to use international law. I was part of a team that brought an application in front of the International Criminal Court. You all, I didn't even talk about the ICC. Can you imagine how long that would have been? But the ICC is its own disaster of bias and politicization. And Kareem Khan, the current office of, of, of the prosecutor, the current prosecutor, is, is I, you know, I can give you the receipts to explain why, but you might already know, has said nothing about Gaza and genocide. In fact, what we understand what he's preparing is just the war crime of starvation in the light of all of these atrocities. But I was part, and in 2015, I wrote the article and published it in Jadalia that argued why you know, the ICC, if it ever took on Palestine as a case, would prosecute Hamas militants first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm and may or may not prosecute Israelis. And guess who the first to be prosecuted? Hamas, right? But I still brought the application in early November. Why? Because I wanted a bigger stage and a greater controversy in order to make the argument of why it's genocide. So sometimes we use the law in counterintuitive ways. Francesca Albanese, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur to the OPT, yesterday presented her findings on genocide. This was a wonderful mobilization of international law. Nicaragua just sued, recently sued Germany for its complicity in genocide. Mexico and Chile just referred uh, Israel and Hamas to the ICC. There's an agitation that's also revealing, the other thing that law is doing here is revealing a politics that colonialism never ended. And there's still a struggle between a global north and a global south, and the global south embedded in the global north, right? And so here you have a different terrain of politics that's taking place using the law as a language and a battleground, but it's not really about the law. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, one last question, and I promise I'll come to you. You mentioned- I tried to answer short. Please come, no, yes. This one, please do keep it short. Okay, you said earlier, 
during your remarks. It is, on, and I'm, I quote, it is on the ground where I learned the laws of war, not in the classroom. And I can now envision all of my students unenrolling from my law courses <laughs> this fall. So please explain um, what you meant by that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, there's this, I, 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 love, I, am a, I am a professor. And it's so ironic, I tell my students, you know, you really have to read. This is the one job you have. And you'll regret it that you don't read because later you're going to be too busy and you're going to mm -hmm. wish mm -hmm. you had as much time as you did to do all this reading. Yes. Right? Because there's so much that it's available you're in You're redeeming yourself already now. Shifte <laughs> yeah. um, that you. Well, I, went, I go back to school. I read, I, I've indicated my own experience, right? Yeah. I went back to school because I also felt I was like, wow, I did so well, but I really didn't learn in the classroom. I spent more of my time learning and, you know, agitating. As in, okay, sorry, now I'm, I'm working <laughs> against your interests. Um, but in order to vindicate that experience. Now, what happens is many of us and many academics, no offense, but many academics oftentimes stay on the track of academia and that's really what they know. So they're engaged in the text and engaged in the footnotes mm -hmm. and engaged in discussions with one another. Mm -hmm. And there is an entire world mm -hmm. from which those texts are coming mm -hmm. um, that provides context and richness that actually reshapes the way that we understand those texts. Okay. So I could very well read the Fourth Geneva Convention, the Hague Regulations, 1897, 1907, mm -hmm. the 77 additional protocols, right? The Genocide Convention, the Apartheid Convention. But I'm on the ground, I'm on the ground um, in a rimal or in a I think khaza'a was really hard for me mm -hmm. because that's where I'm learning about families that were Anyway, um, but that's where I'm learning about people who were targeted yeah. with white flags and having to explain that and looking in the law to explain how is it that they can be targeted and what is the distinction between reckless targeting and what is the distinction between direct, that and direct targeting and them as collateral damage. Um, yeah. yeah, so you come back and you learn these lessons so that when, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Masri says that I'm fearless. It's not so. It's, the, it's just that I've seen it. I've seen it. I know they're lying. And I want to share that with as many people who want to hear about it. Yeah. Extremely well put, Noura. Thank you. Okay, finally, Q&A. Um, do we have mics? Yes. yes, all right, so please raise your hand. We have one here, oh, okay, wow. I'm going to take... I really thought I was clear. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> <laughs> Can I take three questions no, at a we time? We should have done a discussion. I'm sorry. Uh, three questions at a time, yes, is yes. that okay with you? Sure. I think there's a big concentration over here. So let's do one here in the second row. Oh, say one in the first row, one in the second row, and one in the third row, please. And if you could please very quickly introduce yourselves and keep your questions super short. Concise, concise. Hi, my name is Hani. I am Palestinian Jordanian, Canadian, lived here for four years. A uh, question for you. Uh, it's very enlightening to see that you've highlighted our Palestinian leadership with the different avenues they've had mm. and the choices they've made. And uh, a lot of them would argue that they, they use those as a, as a negotiation. And obviously, for how many years, we're not going to say how many years this has been, it's not been working. So what legal routes is left for them to explore? Is, are, can we say some, I'm not a very legal person, I'm an engineer by background, so I don't know much about law. But are there like an, like an expired date for some of the atrocities that has happened and they couldn't could take them back to court or some of the things that they've negotiated that they've agreed with them, they're not going to bring it to court and they, they can't bring it anymore? And so, mm -hmm. so basically, in summary, what, very briefly, what are the uh, vehicles or routes, legal routes that the Palestinian Authority can take? Thank now? you. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Sama. I'm Palestinian Jordanian as well, and I'm a first year here at GQ. Uh, my question is more about 
Hamas in terms of legal framework and international law. So as you said, Gaza is by, according to international law and UN conventions, an occupied territory. So wouldn't that basically classify Hamas as a group that has the international right to defend itself against its occupier by any means necessary, including arms? Thank you. Thanks so much for your riveting talk. Um, I'm Erin McCandless and a distinguished visiting professor at HBKU. Um, and I, I feel that you've described uh, international law as basically an ever-changing social construction that's really rooted in power dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I've written on the, the, mo the movement for a, a rules, a, a, a more principled and just-based order Coming out of coming out of Gaza and the ICJ case uh, as well, and I'm just curious how you would describe or how you think international law can contribute to a new rules-based order. So, really, what's the distinction between rules and and law and politics? If, if okay, that makes thank sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great questions. Um, so, let me just say. You know, there is this question about the Palestinian leadership and what it's doing, and, and the fact that the truth is is that our great, greatest source of potential comes from the status of Palestine um, as a state, recognized by the General Assembly as such, right? That it actually, because of that, is why it becomes a party to the Rome Statute and is able to bring a case at the ICC. It's, you know, why it could refer a case mm -hmm. um, at the ICC as well and, and be recognized. So there is a tremendous amount of potential there. The question is its political will. Do they want to do that? So for example, at this, you know, the, the idea of um, no atrocities have an expiration date. They never expire. They never expire. Unlike other cases that would come under, you know, domestic law. So we can prosecute these cases forever. And we must. And we must. Uh, and, and so, you know, one, I, one thing that came out of, and this is the work of, of Professor Victor Catan, you know, I, I was critical of the recent ICJ uh, case on the legal status of the occupied mm -hmm. territories because I felt like it normalized the Nakba, that it took all this work that we've been doing for decades in order to demonstrate the false nature of a partition between, you know, Israel doesn't have a border. And they don't have a border. So why are we pretending like they have a border and insisting there's a border when there's a false partition rather than the one state reality that we see in front of us, right? Mm -hmm. And so I thought that it would have been more strategic, as did other people, to actually bring a case that challenged them on apartheid and a single jurisdiction. They didn't, right? Now, from that, here's how you can be strategic. From that, even that shortcoming, the fact that we have at this ICJ hearing, I think it was 19 states that recognize that Israel oversees an apartheid regime in the territories. Now it gives us opportunities to create new legal committees in order to investigate that racist colonial structure, right? So this is an opportunity that becomes available even if it wasn't the purpose of the case itself. The purpose of the case is to establish the illegality of the occupation. What comes out of the case, now that we know that there's a sufficient number of states who believe it's apartheid, who are signatories, are parties to the apartheid convention, to actually resuscitate and establish committees, standing committees, working groups that continue to study Israeli apartheid in order to dismantle it, right? So how did this law and this legal hearing create the political opportunity to mobilize? I don't have faith in the Palestinian leadership to do it. But civil society has been doing all this mm -hmm. work. Look at all these protests. Mm -hmm. They've been led by civil society. They've been led mostly by young Palestinians across the globe, by the diaspora, who have done this work. Right? And it, and it goes back to this idea that, you know, our, our Palestinian struggle at the height, at the apex of its revolutionary fervor, was led by young people. You know, when Yasser Arafat takes the helm of the PLO and wrestles it from the control of, of Egypt at the time in 68, was 44 years old. I mean, that's relatively young. 
Consider now a dish Amr Mahmoud Abbas, Masala. Do you know what I mean? But this idea that, you know, we tend to only take the diplomatic approaches the most seriously, and yet it's the young who are leading us. And so even absent this leadership, I still think that there's ample opportunity, and there are some here, very creatively. Very creatively. Hamas. Okay. I agree. This is a legal argument. Let me give you the legal argument. Hamas is a nascent sovereign. They're the last democratically elected Palestinian leadership since 2006. As far as the world is concerned, they're the Palestinian government, as far as the world is concerned. When they use force, they are using force, and this is the work of George Abi Saab, who um, uh, Noha mentioned, Professor Abu Dhab mentioned yesterday. <laughs> Call me Noha, okay. <laughs> um, you know, he was one of the, he was one of the drafters of the 77 protocols that recognize guerrillas as combatants. Mm -hmm. And he describes, right, the main distinguishing factor between legitimate and illegitimate use of force is whether or not you're using it for private gain or public good. When Hamas is using force on behalf of the Palestinian people, it's not using it in order to enrich themselves as a political party. In fact, some may argue that they've actually relinquished the right to govern after this, right, and their authority to govern. But they have used that right on be, as a public good on behalf of the entirety of the Palestinian people, right? International law recognizes that as legitimate, not by any means necessary as you describe, but in fact by really strict regulation, right? That that use of force enshrined, you know, in Article One, Subsection Four of the seventy-seven, you know, first additional protocol, right? describes that peoples who live under alien occupation um, and racist regimes, racist regimes yeah. have the right to use force. They certainly do. But that force has to be regulated also by principles of distinction between civilian and combatant, by proportionality to achieve a military advantage, you know, by other rules of not actually you know, uh, showing your weapons so that you uh, don't conceal them, what the operations look like, and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. So no, if we are going to take, make the legal argument, even you know, those that are using the force for what you may consider a more noble cause have to also regulate it within that framework as well. Okay. The last question, law as a social construction. Yes, that's exactly right. And the law changes meaning over time. To, for example, Security Council Resolution 242 in 1967 was considered as an instrument of defeat to the Palestinians, because it didn't recognize them as a political, as a juridical people. Mm -hmm. It recognized them as a refugee population and recognized Israel as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and then enshrined this quid pro quo arrangement of peace for land. So Palestinians, for years, every single de you know, year, the PNC decried it as a, a, a tool of imperial liquidation of the Palestinian people, until 1987, right? or 1988 specifically in the Palestinian Declaration of Independence, where Palestine is, which is written by Mahmoud Darwish, right? Um, or uh, translated into Arabic by Mahmoud Darwish and written by Edward Said, amongst others, who described 242 and 181 as the basis of the Palestinian state, and now 242 gets rehabilitated. So look at how 242 changes meaning across time, right? Okay, so yes to the social construction. Okay. But this idea of rules, law, and politics, just the last thing on this, and maybe this is a question somebody will ask. We can say as much as we want about our rules-based order, but those rules don't apply the same to all people. And we've seen that most vividly in this case. And so I'm setting somebody else up to ask me about racism. <laughs> okay, can we take another round of questions? Okay, all right. Over here, uh, one, two, three, fourth row over here. Put your hand up, up high. And then in, yes, over here. Nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know. Okay. <laughs> okay, and uh, uh, over there in the back, okay. Maybe we'll take a fourth one, okay? Since you're waving your arms. All right, you're There's number four. I don't have to answer that. You're number four. I'm just conscious of the time. I don't have to answer that. I don't want the organizers to be mad at me. So That's true. Dean Masri has said it's okay. Khalas, it's okay. 
All right, go ahead. Short, please, concise yeah, questions. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sir Al Khatim. I'm um, uh, here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Mohammed Sir Al Khatim. I'm a Georgetown uh, University Qatar alumni. And yes, I am going to ask you about the racism part, but indirectly. You ended the talk, which was very clear, by saying <laughs> free Palestine has become a cry for mm. collective liberation. And we've tapped into something there, something truly powerful and remarkable. That's connecting Native American dances to the Palestinian debka. That's connecting the Irish famine to the starvation that we're seeing now. How do we take this forward? How do we mobilize it? How do we keep it alive? And how do we remember what we feel now? The anger, mm. everything that comes with it in order to push this forward, whether it's through international law, whether it's through civil society, whether it's through collective, collective action. Thank you. Thank you. Number two, over here. Put, can you put your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Mohammed al Fat. I'm actually a, a high school student. And it's really a pleasure meeting you. And I really consider you as a superhero. So. Oh. <laughs> So since October 7th, it's been, it's been 173 days of non-stop genocide, 173 days filled with brutality and massacres. There's more than 32,200 deaths every day, and the ones under the, rev the rebels are not considered, mostly women and children. I mean, it's a deadly war. Uh, for the Palestinian people. What Israel is doing is what America have done with its originals, but worse because <clears throat> we're talking about uh, to soldiers killing civilians for no reason, or you have soldiers sniping miners in the head and document them for fun. We're talking about torturing men and teens for absolutely no reason. So again, and, and we don't need to forget about the endless Israeli um, uh, racist regime. So again, my question, uh, Ms. Noura, as you're a human right attorney, do you really think after all of this brutal years, especially this year's war, um, do you think human rights does apply to the Palestinians? I mean, if it does, it's been 75 years since the, since the establishment of the human rights and 75 years since the occupation of Palestine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Number three over there in the back. You've got, you okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Uh, my name is Manahil Mahmoud, and I'm in Professor Abu Dhab's public international law class. and. We've talked a lot about um, hi. Uh, we've talked a lot about the difference between the laws of occupation and the laws of armed conflict, and Israel claims that they don't exercise effective control over the Gaza Strip after their so-called withdrawal in, in 2005, um, and for that reason, the laws of armed conflict would apply to this situation. However. Uh, we know that if you do exercise effective control over a territory, you can't claim that that territory poses a threat to you. Uh, we read something that you wrote um, um, in, for our class where you distinguished between these two um, principles and said that it, when you're dealing with an occupying power, then the laws of armed conflict are in fact the ones that should take precedent, if I understood that correctly. Um, but would you say, First of all, I just I was wondering if you could explain that. Is it really one or the other? Uh, because if you want to exercise um, the principle of proportionality and distinction, should you not um, look at the laws of armed conflict as well as the law of occupation? Okay, thank you. And then the last one over here, please. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to stand up so you can see me. Hi, my name is Shukran. Yasmin. <laughs> Uh, I'm also from Palestine, uh, Jerusalem and Nablus hybrid. Uh, my first question is, can you be my lawyer if I ever need one? <laughs> and my second question is about the shrinking, shrinking the civilian. Mm -hmm. If I understood it correctly, basically, I mean, anyone in the West Bank, in Gaza, if they ever kind of like held arms or something, that means they never go back to a civilian in which they can't be targeted. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So. Does that also apply to the Israeli population and their citizens, where it's an entire population that is one enlisted in, that is once enlisted in the army? So can't you apply the same to them, where they were once, you yeah. know, in the IDF? So do they ever go back to just a regular citizen status? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Great. Easy questions. Thanks, everyone. 
I'm going to answer this young man's question first. And I just want to tell you that you are so wonderful and so strong and so inspiring. Thank you for being here. Thank you for using your voice and for showing us. I really appreciate your question. You asked, given all of these atrocities, do human rights really apply to Palestinians after all this time? And you're bringing up a question about this contradiction of who counts, right? Which really gets us into what we were answering before, which is what is the work that racism is doing here? We can't ignore that it actually exists, right? Racism is, racism is, is, is a, you know, a form of political economy that stratifies humans based on whose lives are worthy. And it functions on a basis of certain assumptions where, for example, the worst of a group becomes emblematic of that group, right? Where they are presumed guilty until proven innocent. This is all the work of racism, right? You're presumed guilty until you're proven innocent. It inverts logic that we, we normally understand. It makes the person who's racialized less trustworthy as an interlocutor. We don't believe them. We want people to speak for them, right? It makes their lives less worthy. It makes the numbers uh, by which they die somehow rational, right? So this is all the work of, you know, and I know we don't talk a lot about race in the Middle East, although that's also growing in, in uh, Middle East studies and in our own scholarship and even in Palestine studies as part of the work that I'm doing, but it's real here too, right? And so here, in order to respond to your question, do human rights apply? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, because our dignity precedes the law and the way that it's enshrined, right? And it's a way that um, James Baldwin, who is an African-American essayist, um, you know, leader, orator, um, um, spoke at one point when he was asked, uh, what do you make of the Negro problem? And he responded and he said, Black people don't have the problem. It's not our problem. It's in what, how white people see us, right? And so here I want to invert this. It's not that human rights, whether or not they apply to us, you know, it's not that we have been dehumanized. It's that the world has lost its humanity. And Palestinians are teaching us what dignity is, what humanity is what it means to take care of one another in the, in the moments of greatest distress. And so, yeah, here I would say that the problem isn't whether human rights apply or not. It would be the category of whoever got to decide. Because I would say that Palestinians are the paradigmatic example of, of, of what's wrong with it, not what's wrong with them. Which brings me to the question about, um, let me do the LOAC, occupation, law, shrinking civilian, and leave the other Muhammad's question last. It would be a nice note to end on. Mm -hmm. So occupation law is actually a form, is part of the law of armed conflict. So it's, it's a continuum, but it follows after the use of force, right? So that you then have a use in bello, and now you have an end of hostilities that basically mandates how a situation after the end of hostilities should be regulated until the reversion to the status quo ante. And basically what it means is that now only one belligerent has the right of force and has usurped the right, the, all the police powers that exist from the, the people who are occupied. What does that matter if I translate from legalese? It means that the occupying power can no longer use lethal force that the first use of force, that lethal force is the last measure of resort, not the first measure of resort. And that's why it actually mm -hmm. does matter. That's why it actually does matter. Um, in this situation that we're seeing in front of us, this situation is, is quite different because it, we're told that this is prolonged military occupation, but actually what this is, is the annexation of territory by force. And so that's why these become complicated. But in the way that I've explained it, at least when I've been asked to explain it, is that, fine, use distinction, proportionality, but the whole problem is that it's, the whole operation is illegitimate because it's genocidal. On the shrinking civilian, if it applies to us, does it apply to them? All right. 
So I'm gonna complicate this a little bit. First, I'll tell you what they say, Americans and Israelis. Of course not, of course not. And they wouldn't even say that they, this would apply to other state belligerents, but they're saying that it applies to non-state actors. So that's how they make that distinction. Now, here's how I would answer this, which is to say, I actually think we're much better than them. And I think that we have higher morals, and I think that it's precisely because of that higher moral high ground that we are the side of justice. Not because of the oppression that we suffer, but because of the morality and the future that we represent. So I would not invert that equation to make all Israelis legitimate targets, right? It becomes incumbent upon us to think about what is the duty of the oppressed? Is it merely to acquire power and to use it however they feel necessary to vindicate themselves? Or is it to apply lessons so that no one would do it again? Yeah. Um, and then finally, Hamad, Free Palestine. I'm, I'm quoting you. I need your last name so I could do that properly in, in a, a citational practice. How do we remember what we feel? How do we remember what we feel? And I think that that would be a great thing. You know, I think I've heard a lot. Coming from the United States, we're in the heart of empire where there's a lot for us to do. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot for us to protest, and a lot for us to boycott, and a lot for us you know, to get arrested for. And then so I come here and folks are like, what do we do? You know what I mean? <laughs> what do we do? Um, and I think that that might be something for folks here to do, which is to create these collective monuments that capture how you feel and what we feel in this moment. And that can be in, in a collective writing practice and a manifesto that becomes enshrined. It could be in a sculpture that's created. It could be in a quilt that's done collectively. It could be in a form of letter writing that you know, is all placed together. You know, um, Qatar is actually, uh, has evacuated at least 1,500 Palestinian injured children and their families. What does it mean to do this work with them? so that it remembers that they are not passive recipients of our affection and you know, our, our you know, sympathies, but they're agents of change that also help us feel and create that, you know, that memento for the future that will ensure that we also do not forget. So I encourage you um, to do that. I encourage you to do that as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Nora, thank you so much for this fantastic, fantastic talk and for engaging with our students and, and the community here. Um, it, it's, we, we expected nothing less, and so thank you. Maybe if I talk less, you expected I'll, maybe a shorter that's talk? That's true, that's true, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can listen to you, I think, How forever. You, thank you. Um, and thanks also for taking time out of your very busy schedule to come and be here with us and this, at this especially difficult and horrendous and tragic time as we witness genocide in real time, as you said. But thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me, thank you.